thank you for being here. About a year ago, I did something all of you did before you got here. I woke up. And I woke up and my first thought was, oh, I'm sleepy. I didn't get enough sleep today. And then my second thought was, shit, I don't have enough time to get ready. And then my morning started. It was a rushed ritual and I ran from appointment to appointment. And my life was busy, but it was necessary. Because there was a lot to accomplish. I mean, I did a lot of fun stuff in my life, but there's more, right? So I called it growth. Growth in my job, growth in competences, growth in life, growth in mindset, in, in my social network, more friends, more meetings, more of everything. And it led to the belief that I am busy, so I exist. And that one day I just told you about was a very different day because I came home that night and had a huge emotional breakdown. And I really didn't get why though, because I felt like it, I had it all. I had this brilliant career and people called me a high potential. And I had a pile of diplomas and the newest iPhone and a really awesome apartment with cool stuff. I thought, I'm just checking the whole checkbox to be a, a complete person, a successful person, a happy person. But I wasn't. I felt dissatisfied, empty. There was this gaping void in my life. And I really didn't get it. Why couldn't I just be happy with what I had at that time? Why was there always something better, newer, cooler to pursue? Why was it simply never enough? Lynn Twist, she is a pretty famous uh, doctor on the field of uh, life fulfillment, uh, shows that many people wake up like me, even before her feet touch the ground we're already feeling like we're losing or we're short on something. We don't exercise enough. We don't have enough work. We don't get paid enough. We don't have enough profit. Or not enough power, not enough nature to relax in, not enough time, not even close. We don't have enough money at all. We're not smart enough. We're not clever enough. We're not fit enough, not well read and not successful enough. And this results in the feeling that we're just never done. We go to bed with that thought and we wake up with the illusion of shortage. And according to Lynn, this is the basis of a hurried life. It's also the basis of a very unfulfilled one. And the shitty part about it, it was my life. And I was very frustrated. I was just really frustrated. I walked around with this, I think people call it a quarter life crisis for weeks, <laughs> maybe months. And then someone gave me some advice. The person told me, Marloes, when you do what you always did, you just get what you always got. And I always did more. So I figured, what if I do less? And well, then I did, I guess, what any millennial would do. Uh, I Googled it and uh, I found out that if you Google for less, you get over three billion hits. Uh, wasn't very encouraging, I can tell you. And um, after that, I guess I did what any, any other millennial would do too. I got pretty distracted and I started to watch Netflix. Um, and at Netflix, you have this new feature where uh, movies and documentaries, they start playing without you asking for it. And well, normally it's really annoying, but this time a documentary started playing. And it started with a quote. It said, so much of our lives is lived in this fog of automatic habitual behavior. 
We spend so much time on the hunt, but nothing ever quite does it for us. And we get so wrapped up in that hunt, it just makes us miserable. It grabbed me. It was a story of two American guys, they were called the minimalists, and I didn't really get it. Because I've heard of it before, but I found it rather sad, the, the minimalist people. Because I've, I, yeah, well, I felt, I know, they were, they were living, I don't know, with 10 things in a suitcase, and they were not allowed to have a car or a home. You're not allowed to like colors. I don't know, I, I was really thinking that it, that it was a very restrictive lifestyle. And, well, as you can tell me standing here today about minimalism, I was very wrong. Minimalism isn't about quantity, it's about quality. And that's something very different in our world of today. Because our world is about growth. It's about numbers. Look at the news, for example. We're talking about having more profits, having more purchasing power, having more of everything for companies, but also for ourselves. Think about it. We all know that stuff isn't making us happy, right? but there are people sleeping in front of Apple stores to get a new iPhone. We all know that relationships are super important for us, but we hang out more with our online friends than with our offline ones. We cancel dinner plans with our parents because we have to work late to make more money. That's the thing. We all know it, but we do it anyway. I knew it, I did it anyway. And that made me think, because how is that possible? We are living in the Western world, we have the best standard of living ever. Why do we always want more? And I found three factors, three triggers, that are actually making us believe in that world of more. And the first one is there's a slide missing, but it doesn't matter. Um, the first one is a biological trigger. We all have it in our head. You might recognize it from uh, animals, for example, hunting for food in summer to have enough in the winter. It's a survival strategy. Animals have it, and the early humans had it too. And we still have it, but it's creating a disconnect because we don't really need it anymore. Mother Nature's playing us, and it gives us a restless feeling. And what we want to do, we want to act on it. And acting, well, that's, make it, that's been made very easy today, because our more trigger, it's stimulated all the time. We get so many messages about how we should live our life. It's on our phones, it's on television, it's in our books, it's in a newspaper, it's outside on buses, along highways. You might have guessed it, it's advertisement. Here in the Netherlands, an average person sees in between 500 and 3,000 ads a day. Think about it, that means that you get messages from people that are trying to convince you that your life is this close to being complete. But you just need that one product, that one product that fix, fits your collection, and there you're good, times 3,000 a day. Um, and that's making it easier for us to act on the urge, on the, on the restless feeling. And that creates the third thing I like to point out, trends. I really thought a long time about how to explain this, and then it made me think about fashion. Because when I was small, I went shopping with my mom, and we only had two seasons, summer and winter. Well, pretty easy, right? And uh, then uh, I grew up, and fast fashion did too. And this means that we have 52 seasons a year now. Some stores even have 365. What that means, you really have to think about this, what it means is that you buy something today and it's out of fashion tomorrow. Like tomorrow, it's not broken, there's nothing wrong with it. 
it's just out of trend. And think about it, we have this trigger. It gets triggered like a thousand of times. And then when you finally buy something, the whole rat race starts all over again because you're out of trend, so you get triggered again. And we end up with a house full of crap, stuff we don't need. And the worst thing is we're really polluting our planet. We're using materials that our Earth is not even able to provide. Let's just stop this madness. I thought about the narrative we're living on, and I think we need another one. We need a new narrative about enough. And for me, minimalism is a way to change that narrative. I did a lot of experiments with it, and it showed me a surprise, a surprising truth about enough. Because I can tell you, it's not a number, it's not quantitative, it's a context. It's a context that we make ourselves. It's the knowledge that we know that there is enough and that we are enough. So, minimalism, think about that. Awkward silence, nothing there, it's minimalism. Um, today I'm here to tell you what I've learned doing this new narrative of enough. And the thing is, it's really hard to find it, to get to that point. And that's why I want to share with you today my dance moves. Because the theme of today is shut up and dance, right? And I'm here to dance the minimalist two-step. I like to show you. The first step of minimalism is identifying what's important to you. The second step is eliminating everything else. And that's quite a lot. Finding out the thing that is most important to you is for some people very easy, for some people very hard. The thing is, you cannot read it in a book because it's truly yours. Some people get ultimate happiness about having a stamp collection in a book. Others travel the whole world and some others just like a nice cup of tea in their backyard. And it's all good because the most important thing is, it is yours. It's truly yours what's important for you. The thing in my crisis though, <laughs> was that I really didn't have a clue what that was for me. So I didn't start at one, I started at two. I started eliminating stuff, literal stuff, like books, clothes, office supplies, random stuff I bought at the Xenos to make my home look more like my home. Yeah. And this might sound really easy, huh? but it's, it's really not. It really confronted me with myself and with my thoughts. Very often I thought, no, I can't throw this away. I spent so much money on it. Was I ever planning on using it? Nope. Or I thought, I, I'm actually going to use this. And then I really thought about it in, I don't know, five years. And then I realized letting go of this stuff makes room for the things that I found important. And it did. I got rid of a lot. I got rid of over 1,500 items. And I didn't miss a single item. Literally none. It's crazy, right? And this made me feel that I was back at step one. I started at step two, eliminating stuff, which made room for the things that I found important. Step two, 
step one. And these important things, they really made me happy. I'm a happy minimalist dancer, and that's why I'm here today. I'm here to tell you that there is an alternative for enough, but that you have to dare to dance. You have to dare to let go of your dance moves and to try and experiment with something else. And it's hard. You need courage, but you can do it. So i just like to take this moment that we have right now and think about it. Take a deep breath and ask yourself, are you ready for a life of enough? A life of less stress, but more life. A life of less others, but more you. A life of less stuff, but more happiness. If you are, I like to challenge you. Let go of one thing today. One thing. It can be that ugly towel laying around in your storage locker for a while. It can be that business card of a guy you're not planning on calling anyway. It can be intangible. It can be a to-do task that's not really helping you. It can be a product that's not adding value to your life. I just want to encourage you to take a look at your dance routine and find your way towards a world of less. And while you do that, I just want to give you the best advice that was given to me during this journey. And that's when you do what you always did, you'll get what you always got. Thank you very much for listening.